I'm David Skeer from Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne. And the gospel for the, this Sunday is uh, Luke chapter 14, 25 to 35. And we'll read it in the English and then make reference to the Greek where that is necessary. Uh, with this uh, prelude or explanation ahead of time, and that is uh, Luke does not use uh, the, the Greek with the same theological precision as Matthew does. Uh, this is, these are stories, and uh, the stories, uh, they carry themselves along. Where the words are important, they are important, but they are not absolutely fundamental to coming to conclusion of what it is. So we'll read it in English. Now great multitudes accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost whether he has enough to complete it? Other, uh, otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin uh, to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to an encounter to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and take counsel whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him? who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an embassy and asks terms of peace. So therefore, whoever of you does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? Rhetorical question. It is fit neither for the land nor the dunghill. Men throw it away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I love this particular passage. Uh, it's a, it's it's the most uh, one of the most disruptive things that we have in the preaching of Jesus. And that is, we have a tendency to think that our family is the church. Now Luther saw that the family was one of the three estates the government, the family, and the church. Uh, I don't think there's a pastor out there. In fact, every pastor out there, wherever he is, has a problem within his congregation that the believing members of the congregation are, uh, are distraught because they're married uh, to an unbeliever or their children are unbelievers. Pastors' children become our unbelievers. There are, there are pr many men who are very prominent in our church body have children who are not affiliated with the church. And if they are affiliated with the church. Now Jesus comes along here and says that one of the necessities of uh, being a Christian is that you have to hate your own family members. Now that sounds, that sounds, uh, that sounds very strict and incomprehensible. However, uh, Jesus is not just speaking about breaking ties with the family. He says, you you even have to hate your own life, your own CK. Now there, the word life doesn't mean soul. It means. Um, it means everything that belongs to your to our existence here on earth. Everything that that has to do with our being humanity, our, our family, our friends, our houses, our vacations, our cars, all the things. Jesus says you have to hate them. And uh, well, Jesus is pretty clear about this. You cannot serve God in money. You cannot do it. Now, on a very on a more practical basis. I've been at the seminary for a couple of years at least. And uh, one of the things that always astounds me, which I always admire, is that the students, the young men who come here to study for the ministry, and they're doing it for the sake of the people in the church, 
They literally have given up all things. And they are living parables of what the Christian life has to be. And uh, Jesus follows up here in 28, uh, verse 28, uh, 27, whoever does not carry his own cross and comes, and comes after me, that one is not able to be my disciple. Uh, I've had discussion with family members, my own family, with some a little extended. They like the church, but the family comes first. The family comes first. Always the family comes first, no matter what you say. Whatever the family wants, they have to do. Jesus here has a radical ethic. And this shouldn't be too astounding, really, because Jesus Jesus put his relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He put us, he's, that is his relationship to us sinners, he places before us. And then there are some, there are some astounding illustrations. It's almost as if Jesus here is discouraging evangelism. It's almost as if Jesus here is speaking to uh, people in a membership class, catechumens, who have more or less thought about joining the church and learning the Christian doctrine. And then the pastor comes in and says, are you sure you really want to become a member of the church? That's what it says here. And uh, he says here, about building a tower it does not when you build a tower don't you sit down and count the cost whether you, whether you have enough money to complete it that's in verse 28 now that's really beautiful um, I don't know we ought, we there there are laws about this there are laws in certain cities that if the house or the building is not completed within a specific amount of time it has to be torn down. Apart from the law, looking at a building which is, and I know, I know where we spend the summers in, in Pennsylvania, there, there's a whole row of townhouses not completed because there's, they were built during the time when uh, uh, the economy was good and the economy went bad. And so when you look at a building which is not completed, it is certainly a, a well, you're aware of it, and you realize that there wasn't too much thought going going into it. Um, this, by the way, is, Christianity d involves sacrifice. Now, that's a very uncomfortable thought, especially in the United States, especially with the with the, with the Christianity that's offered on the television. That Christianity doesn't demand sacrifice. It's a way in order to improve your financial and social situation. And pastors do face this problem that some people will quit their church, will quit the, con the Lutheran congregation to join another church of another denomination because it's more financially beneficial to them. And then there's the story of a king. You don't go to, we've, we've had these discussions of what constitutes a just war. Now, uh, uh, with the first George Bush, uh, we were going to enter the realm of peace. And, uh, of course, that didn't happen at all. And so it's a favorite topic theologically among Lutherans is what is a just war? The Lutheran dogmatician set down, set down certain characteristics of what is a just war. Well, Jesus explains it in financial ways. He says, if you're not going to beat the other guy, don't go to war. When he says, apply, you'd better give your whole self over to Christ and to the Christian message and to Christianity. Otherwise, don't do it at all. I wonder if his thought is, it'd be better to stay an unbeliever and face the consequences than to become a believer and then to back off. Those consequences are even worse. And um, 
I wonder if Jesus had in the back of his mind uh, the story of the Gibeonites in the book of Judges. They had realized how successful the Israelites were, how Joshua was, and they go out and they, they, uh, they, they give the impression that they've sat, traveled a long distance. They're hungry and they're sweaty and they're hot and their clothes are all worn. And uh, they said, oh, please make peace. And of course, they do sign a treaty of making peace. Well, it's almost, it's almost the, what, what's here. They were deceptive, of course. Uh, you have to think about this. If, Of course, the, the, the message here is don't go to war unless you have it there. And you'd better think it twice about becoming a Christian. And then Jesus puts the... Uh, the, it is verse 33 that explains the whole situation. So therefore, whoever of you does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciples. Now on that particular point, that's going to be the... T I wonder how many of us really have the courage or the guts to preach on this situation. We, family churches are great. They go, they go back and among us Missouri Synod Lutherans back into the 1800s and they are the the backbone of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod these families but at the same time the love of Christ has to supersede uh, the love of our family boy that's a delicate issue and that, you don't want to let's not preach law on that that's that's that is that's non-productive that's non-productive to preach law. We do not want to do that on this situation that the people haven't given a much. But there is an either or that can be, be, be presented. Now, what is um, this? Is the, what the, the last uh, two verses in this pericope would be enough uh, to preach a whole sermon on. Uh, I have uh, I've said to some of the ladies in my congregations, hey, you are the salt of the earth. That's the way we use the term. Check it out in a book of idioms, the salt of the earth. These are people that really make the world go around. And we mean by that, well, in one sense, we mean it's the idea of salt being used as a flavor. And a food enhances the, enhances the flavor. Now, that's been a... That's been a typical characteristic interpretation of the use of the word salt. And that can really be used very that there is definitely people in the church who are the salt of the earth whenever there's a problem or whenever you need something, they're there to do it and they're there to contribute to the cause. They are they are the salt of the earth. Without them, now humanly speaking, the church would not go forward and they should be admired for that. The other meaning of salt that you have heard is that it's a preservative that in the ancient world you salted things now i don't come from the farm and you know that but uh you when you salt things when you salt meat it preserves them and uh in a in, a, in an economy in which there are no refrigerators salted foods last longer they are preservative so the meaning, the meaning at least might be, but it isn't, that the Christians are uh, the Christians are the reason that God preserves the world. We are the preservative ones. However, I'm not so sure about either of those interpretations. I think we could look at it this way: salt is good. Now, the translation that I have in front of me says the salt has lost its taste. Uh, I'm not so sure that that's, the, uh, that that's the correct interpretation. You know, when it comes to learning a, a foreign language, very few of us can read it right off, we can read the Greek right off. If we're doing this every week before we prepare our sermon, we get into a kind of a rhythm and we know this. But still we, de we depend. At the present time, I'm depending on the Greek and the English at the same time. 
And it says here, the salt is beautiful. If, however, also, the salt, and the word is, the word for, mo the word, it's the word for moron. If the salt, if the salt becomes idiotic, if the salt is no longer salt, how shall it be salted? Now, I think the correct interpretation for that is, Salt was used in the sacrifices of the Old Testament. And th so th the meaning here is salt. Uh, and if, it, if, if the sacrificial element of the Christian faith is not included, is not included in how we understand Christianity, then it's no longer Christianity. Now that's pretty, those are pretty tough words that without us without the course we all agree that the sacrifice of christ is at the heart of the church that's what we believe but jesus is not speaking behind this phrase of course is his own sacrifice that's the salt but what he is speaking here specifically is about us that if this aspect of our christian life of the sacrifice is not included in our uh, is not included in how we understand our faith. And here, <laughs> you know, Jesus can be sometimes, I don't know whether you want to say coarse or cruel. It says that it's neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill. Wow. I don't think you want to put that in any stronger language. And then comes this warning. He who has ears to hear, let him hear, which means... This is not something you can put to the side. Now, the corresponding Old Testament uh, lesson is from Deuteronomy 30, 15 to 20. And uh, it's Moses. And it's again, it's an either or. That's how I would describe uh, the pericopes for this particular Sunday. They are either you're with Jesus or you're not. He demands total commitment to himself. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, you shall possess the land. And when it speaks about keeping the commandments, this is not the idea of moral perfection. It's the idea that the Christian accepts everything which God has revealed to him. Reveal, and that can also be included in 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 the sermon. That information at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. And then this this Sunday is unusual in the sense uh, we get to read an entire book of the Bible in one service, and uh, it's from Philemon. I've always wanted to teach a course in pastoral theology on Philemon. And maybe that should be the sermon. Because what's so amazing in this pericope, Paul says he could demand all of these things, but he won't out of Philemon. If Philemon becomes the person who loves Jesus more than he loves his own life, because he has to give up his he has to give up his slave Philemon. And that's the sacrifice which he has to make to uh, do it well this this presents this is an either or sunday and i think it's going to be very interesting to work or a pleasure to work on a sermon with that one thank you very much